Thanks, Rico. Good morning. How are you all? Yeah? You guys good? Awake? Alive? I love that Cody has an emergency cup before getting here. I have an emergency pot of coffee before getting here. <laughs> that's just, that's what it takes to get here. And then you enjoy your cup of coffee, right? <sighs> well, it is good to be with you all. Um, our team, several of our team are, are in Mexico, um, heading back today where they've been serving this weekend. Um, children um, in Tijuana at an area called The Dump, and they've been just loving on kids and families and taking a bunch of donations and food, um, partnered with Reach Up, Reach Out. And so Hona and, and our daughter Malika are also there this morning. And so keep, keep our team in your prayers as they're heading back. We look forward to hearing their testimonies and stories um, of the time there. Um, and as Cody was saying, we have been in a series diving into the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is such an incredible book. We're going to continue that this morning. Um, we'll have verses for you on the screen, but please feel free to follow along on your phone or your Bible um, if you have one with you. So um, just a quick recap for those of you who are new. Ephesians is a handwritten letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And this letter was written somewhere between 60 to 62 AD. Paul is writing from prison, and he's writing to the church community, the body of believers in Ephesus. And Ephesus is a unique place. It is a bustling, urban environment. It is the center of a lot of trade. It's also the center of a lot of pagan worship. Um, the, the Christians in Ephesus were famous for being real, like, go-getters, get it done, excellent. They, everybody was doing something powerful. Everybody had vision. Everybody was going after God powerfully. They were kind of just famous for their, their labor, their, their kingdom efforts. And, uh, and so Paul is writing this encouragement. And really the first three chapters, um, we're, we'll get into the final of those that first half today. The first three chapters are very doctrinal, and the last three are very practical. Um, very life application. I'm going to warn you right now. Ephesians chapter 4 next week, it's all about maturity. So you're just going to want to go ahead and get your life together this week. Start confessing, repenting, all the things now. Because even in preparing that, I'm like, Jesus, help me and my mature, immature self, right? It, so we're going to dive into, it gets real practical the next three weeks. But um, th this book is really a lot about understanding our identity in God, taking our position um, the first week we talked about being adopted into his family, being chosen, belonging, being predestined in his family. Um, and the second week we talked a lot about being powerful citizens in the kingdom. What does it mean to, to live out your authority, to live out the authority you have in God as a citizen, as somebody who belongs in his kingdom? And so this week we're going to be diving into the theme of chapter 3, which is that we are empowered. We are empowered in God. Um, and so before we get into scripture, before we get into the word, I, I want to share with you um, an experience that I've, I had years ago that deeply, deeply impacted my life. Now, if you've been around here for like a decade, you've probably heard me share this experience. If you've only been here for a couple years, you've probably never heard me share this, but because um, I haven't shared it in a long time, but it, it truly is the most, um, if I could think of a moment that most dramatically altered my life, it was this moment. If I could think of the craziest God experience of my life, it was this moment. It was the moment that completely set my course in a different direction. Um, I don't know how else to explain it other than it was one of those God moments that completely changed me. And um, I was right out of college and 21 years old, passion for justice, passion for for God, but also just kind of wrestling through a lot of stuff and had this experience with the Lord. And I don't want it to sound super spiritual because it's not like, oh, I just went into this vision. Like, it, I think sometimes people make things sound so weird, but there's also a place when you're just, as you're encountering God, the spirit realm is real. We talked about this last week. The kingdom is real. The spirit realm is real. And we are designed and wired to hear God and to experience God. And he's given you an image center through which he wants to speak to you and give you downloads and images and dreams and prophetic pictures. And, and so this is one of those moments. And I was in this place of prayer. I'm just leaning into the Lord. And I just began to feel the presence of God so, so strong. And 
as I was in his presence, I began to have a, a vision or just a picture. And I saw Jesus standing outside of this huge house and kind of welcoming me in. And as I walked in, it was like I could see there was all these rooms in this house. And I could see that there were like, like Christians. I just happened to know there were Christians. There were like Christians in all these different rooms in the house. And people were drawn to different rooms and hanging out in different rooms. And, you know, some were in the, the library room. I knew this was like heaven. It was like some were in the library room of heaven, you know. And it was like just drawn to like knowledge and wanting to dig deep in scripture. And I was like, oh, I know those kinds of Christians. You know, they're buried in the books. And then some were drawn to the, like, the armory room of heaven, right? And they're, like, picking up swords and jostling. And I'm like, oh, I know those kinds of Christians looking for a fight, right? Some were drawn to the wine cellar. Y'all know. Y'all know those type, you know? Just drinking the Holy Spirit, you know, just having a good old time in the wine cellar. And it was like people were drawn to all these different rooms, but they're all part of his house. And why just stay in one room, Right? This was all his house, and I'm kind of getting a tour of the house, and, and as I, in this experience, I, I feel the Lord say, I want to show you the most important room in the house, and my ears perked. Where's that, right? And he begins to lead me into this room, and it's, it's I, I can't explain really what it, what it looked like wasn't, it wasn't anything interesting. It was more what it felt like in there. It felt, I felt so seen. I felt so known. I felt so loved. I felt so valuable. I felt so connected. And, and I'm just in this room, just like, oh my goodness, this is the most amazing room. And, and I heard the Lord say, this is the intimacy chamber. And I understood in that moment, like connection with God is the most important thing. It's, it's better than any knowledge we could have of him. It's better than any just, you know, great thing we could accomplish for him. Intimacy and connection with him is the most important thing. And as I was in this place and just taking this in, all of a sudden, I noticed that, that in this room, there was a little wooden trap door on the floor. And honestly, it didn't look like it belonged because everything was, like, ornate and beautiful. But this, it was just, like, raw, unfinished wood. It was weird. And I just was like, what is that? And, and in this experience, I heard Jesus say, that leads to a place called the weeping room. And that sounded awful. And I was like, why would you connect a room called the weeping room to the most special place in the house. And in this experience, Jesus told me, he said, because that's where I spend most of my time. I was like, ah, my theology is really messed up right now. I thought there was no crying in heaven. Like, what's happening? You know, and, but it's like in those moments, you can't, you can't figure it out. You just have to embrace what God's doing. And, and so I said, I opened the door and I said, that's where you spend your time. Well, I want to go there. And he kind of pauses me and he says, well, hold on. Very, he tells me, very few of my kids actually really want to spend time with me there. And it broke my heart. And I was like, why? And he said, well, it's not like this room. It's not warm and fuzzy and all about you. And I was like, dang. But I was like, Lord, but if that's where you spend your time, that's where I want to go. I want to be with you. And he said, okay, it's uncomfortable. Are you willing? Yes. So I began to walk down in this experience, this long staircase, and um, it's weird because it was like, I, I have such vivid memories of this, but it's like I could hear all the other rooms in the house, but this was like hidden in the very heart of the house. And I, there was this tiny little door at the end of the staircase that, that led into this tiny little room that was so humble and so simple. In fact, it looked like if you've been to countries where there's houses made of, of mud bricks, it looked like mud brick walls, and it looked like a window that was just merely a how windows are, are made in those houses. There's no window. It's just an opening. And um, there was a little wooden chair. And the second we get into this room, I actually have to get on my knees to get through the door because it's so small. And the second we get in this room, Jesus sits in this chair, and he turns his head, and he looks out the window. And as he's looking out the window, all of a sudden I have this wild awareness of why this room is called the weeping room. Now, I know I'm taking a long time to, to break down an experience. You're like, where are we going? This applies to Ephesians 3, so I want you to hang with me. But in this experience, from this window, there is a mass flood of images and sounds rushing from the earth. Every single act of injustice, 
every starving child, every woman being raped, everything on the earth that's painful, people crying out, and it's all images and sounds coming through this window, and Jesus is sitting there intensely listening and watching everything, and he is weeping. And he is heartbroken. And he it was deeply present and deeply invested in every painful thing. Whether these people knew him or not didn't matter. They were his kids. And he was on attention. He was, he was so passionately in love with every person. And I, w- I couldn't look at the window because it was way too much. Way too much to take in. All I could do was look at him. And I began to, in this experience, just scream, wail. I don't even know how to explain Other than it was like, I felt like my guts were being ripped out of me. When I looked at him, I was like, oh, my gosh, he's so good. He's so good. He's so present. He's so loving. He's so, he's so kind. I just was so undone by him. And um, as this experience progressed, um, I actually spent hours and hours and hours just weeping and just being so wrecked in this experience. I noticed that behind Jesus was a door that led out of this room. And I asked and I said, where does this room lead to? Where, 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 is, where does this go? And he said, that is the strategy room of heaven. And it was like instantly I understood that in that room, there was strategy for everything we needed on this earth. There is strategy right now in heaven for the songs you're supposed to write. There's strategy in heaven for Afghanistan, right? There's strategy in heaven for your family, for your business. There's strategy in heaven for every issue under the sun. God's not like in heaven thinking, dang, what are we going to do about the Middle East? God has perfect strategy for everything, right? From like the smallest thing in your life to huge global issues, God has strategy. And I understood in that moment, that is the room we've all been longing for. That's the room we all want to get into, we need, it's available to us. And, and <clears throat> in this experience, I, I asked if I could go in there. Now, Jesus' response was not very kind, but I, I understood what it meant. If you've heard me share this, you know exactly what he said to me. But I, I said, God, can I go in there? And, and he said, no, you're too fat. Uh, come again, Jesus? Right? No, you're too fat. You're too big. You won't fit through the door. You have to spend time in this room. Letting your heart be broken for what breaks my heart. You have to sit in this room and see, start to, it's one thing to know God's a God of compassion. It's another thing to actually feel his compassion. You see, because when you spend time in that place, letting your heart get broken with what God's heart breaks for, learning to love the people God loves for real, then it strips away your own pride. It strips away your own agenda. It strips away your own timetable for your life, your own, well, it should be this way, your own, all of it. It You just begin to say, God, whatever it takes, let's go get them. Whatever it takes, Jesus, take my life. I lay down all of it. I lay down my money. I lay down my comfort. I, I lay it all down, Jesus. I am so wrecked with your heart for humanity. You see, it's through that place, spending time in the weeping room, that we then are allowed to go into the strategy room, Right? Now, just to, to kind of tie this up, um, that changed the course of my life. I so radically encountered Jesus in that weeping room that for me, my life changed. I had to live in the weeping room. The next three years of my life looked like moving to the slums, you know, in, in Africa, the remote tribes. I, mean, I had to hold the dying. This was part, that was my journey. My journey was I found Jesus radically in the weeping room. And I... I Every time I would close my eyes, I would see Jesus in the weeping room. And I just felt like I was being transformed on the inside. And it was a couple years later where the Lord um, and another experience invited me into the strategy room. And I was like, God, I'm good. I'm happy to stay in the weeping room. And he was like, that's why it's time. (laughs) Welcome to the strategy room. And and it was in another experience where I had this, you know, I saw the Lord anointing me with, with authority and with identity and power to, to walk into strategy. And I feel like so much of the things we've witnessed in our life have come from that, that strategy room, the strategy from heaven, right? But I wanted to tell you this because this experience, it begins with intimacy, and then you go to a, a more mature level where it's not just about what God can do for you and how God makes you feel, but more mature love where it's about, God, what's on your heart? 
What do you care about? How was your day, right? Where you begin to, to like let your life be consumed with what consumes him, which is humanity, people. And then from there, there's authority to walk in the supernatural, to do things you couldn't do, to have the downloads and the strategy for the things that we're all longing to see happen, right? I wanted to start with that because this really, in a lot of ways, is the theme that we see here in Ephesians chapter 3. Love is what opens the door to compassion in our life, and compassion opens the door to walking empowered, to walking powerfully. So let's jump into to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 14. So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father. I love that. He's a perfect Father of every father and child in heaven on earth. And I pray that he would unveil, which is another, you know, reveal or make known, that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your inmost being with his divine might and explosive power. Wow. Isn't that good? When we grasp that, right, supernatural strength begins to flood your inmost being so that we can walk in explosive power. That's really good. Verse 17, then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Pause. Whew. I don't know about you. I want his love to be the source and the root of my life. Not something I'm trying to grab onto, trying to find out there. I want, the, I want to be so at home, so at rest in his love. But it does require faith. Verse 18, then, then you will be empowered. Can we all say empowered? Empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Preach that, right? Endless love. Beyond measurement that transcends our understanding, this extravagant love pours into you until you're filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream. And he'll exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all. For his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. Amen. I love this. See, when we really understand who he is, that he is a good father, that he is Jesus who sits in the weeping room deeply invested in humanity, that he doesn't start loving people when they get their life together and start acting right. No, he is deeply in love with humanity, right? When we understand that he's a perfect father, when that goes deep inside of us, then all of a sudden supernatural strength begins to, to flood in us and powerful things begin to happen around us. You see, the reality is we get our identity straight, then we can walk with authority, which is why Ephesians 1 comes before Ephesians 3, right? We get our identity straight, who he is and who we are in him, so that we can walk empowered. See, when we truly engage our faith, like active, living faith, his love begins to well up inside of us, and we're empowered. It's the kind of love that, that blows your mind, right? The kind of love that, that transforms you and the world around you. He wants to do way more than we can imagine. But here's what we have to understand. When love is my source, I'm empowered by God to do the impossible. When love is the source, truly, not just I love you, eh, you know, no. When love, when you are gripped with love, all of a sudden you become empowered to do the impossible. I'm going to read part of that out of the Amplified. I'm going to start in verse 17. And may you, having been deeply 
rooted and securely grounded in love. Be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, God's people, the width and length and height and depth of his love. Fully experiencing that amazing endless love. That you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. May you be filled throughout your being to all the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives, completely filled and flooded with God himself. I love this. It's in our being rooted in his love, experiencing it for ourselves, not just, you know, somebody telling you God loves you. God wants to reveal his love to you. He wants you to experience it for yourself. Right? When we're rooted in his love for us and for others, all of a sudden things begin to shift. We understand that we're empowered in that place. See, empowerment and love go hand in hand, or power and love go hand in hand. In fact, these two things were never meant to be separated. In fact, it's love that empowers you. Love and power were never meant to be separated. And we're talking this week about what it means to be empowered in God. But the reality is we don't need a bunch of people running around trying to move mountains that don't have love in their life. Because it's love that is the actual power source for our life. And as one of my favorite mentors, who's mentored me without never knowing, without ever knowing, Martin Luther King Jr., one of my favorite quotes from him, Power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. But power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Isn't that good? Power and love were never meant to be separated. They're not separated in who God is. Jesus is perfect power and perfect love. Here's the truth, and it's a hard pill to swallow, but it's the truth. You don't have authority where you don't have love. Now, listen, you might walk in all kinds of high five, loving that, like high fives from people, likes, following. Your business might be exploding. From a human perspective, you might be looking like like you, your career, your ministry, or whatever is doing great. It might be looking like you're doing great. But if you're being measured by heaven, because human measurements are different and can be deceiving. If we're, if we're looking for the well done, good and faithful servant, that only comes through our levels of love. Right? It comes through our love, and and when love is the source, powerful things are going to happen in our life. But you can have all kinds of powerful things and and be missing the most important thing. Love is not just a requirement to be powerful. Love is what makes us powerful. Right? It's what marked Jesus and what we're told should be the defining factor of what marks us. Experiencing the love of God, being transformed by his love, and letting that love seep out of our lives is literally the most empowering, transformative thing that you carry. If you want to see the world change, if you want to see your classmates be, encounter Jesus, if you want to see your neighbors encounter Jesus, it's going to be because you learn to love them. Let me tell you a story. When I was in high school, now you guys, I've told you some stories of my high school, so y'all know already, uh, most of you. The high school, I, I, the town I grew up in, the high school I came from was extremely ghetto, okay? And um, hardcore gang culture, pretty much everybody's a cholo. Like, it's just, it was intense. Like, blood all over the sidewalk every day. I mean, it was crazy. Like, felt kind of like the only objectives in, in our high school were, A, don't get jumped today. B, don't get pregnant today. I mean, that was kind of the motto in our high school. I'm not even kidding. It was, help me Jesus. So. Um, there was a girl who I will change her name. We'll call her Veronica, Vero, very appropriate. And um, she hated me, which was not unusual because people didn't need a reason to hate anybody. Everybody was just looking to fight constantly. I mean, there were fights daily in our school. And um, 
So this girl was constantly, and she was in a gang, and her whole crew, they were just awful, um, constantly after me. I didn't know them. They had no reason to not like me. They just didn't like me. And so it looked like, you know, them, like literally I'd be trying to cross the street and they'd like try to run me over in their car, like constantly trying to jump me. Like it was insane. And I was just like, this was a a season in my life where I had just told the Lord, like, I am all in, 100%. Let's go. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to fully live for you. I was like sharing my faith with my classmates. I was leading a weekly Bible. I'm leading all these kids to Jesus. I am trying to keep my testimony intact. Okay. Okay. And this girl is messing me up, all right? She was messing me up. And, um, I mean, every day was just the worst. I mean, just screaming awful things to me. Um, her and her friend's favorite thing to do was to bark at me, which is, wow, okay? And, um, you know, throwing every day eggs on my car, soda on my car. I mean, just constant, like constantly, constantly. And I was just like, oh, Jesus, and I was so frustrated, and I hit this point where I'm, like, trying to live right, right, <laughs> trying to live right. But I am like, Holy Spirit, I just need, I, I just need, like, five minutes with her. Just, can you just turn for, like, five minutes? Just give me, like, five minutes. Okay, you're too busy. Can you give me two? Can we do two? Like, what? I just need a minute. I just need a minute to lay some holy hands on this sister. You know what I mean? <sighs> and the Lord was, you know, like, pray for her. And I'm like, I have been praying for her. It's not working. She's not changing. And God was like, oh, you thought prayer was to change her? No, prayer is to change you. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm the innocent one here. Why do I got to change, you know? And, uh, and I just began to pray for her for months, months. I mean, praying for her. And every day was hell. And I, as I'm praying for her, I begin to just become, I don't know, I, I just begin to really love her. I couldn't, I couldn't not love her. It was like as I would pray for her, all of a sudden my heart would begin to break for her family and why she was the way she was, and and she was the ringleader of this whole crew. And, you know, I just, I began to really, like, my heart really changed for her. And um, and then there was this one day, and I, um, stepping into my my typing class, now for all you Gen Zers, that's an ancient machine we used to use. (laughs) where you would push buttons and write things? <laughs> Google it. Um, so I was in typing class, and um, she walks by. I'm walking into typing class, and she walks by in the hallway and does her usual. Well, this was one of the first times I ever saw her without her whole crew, right? She was by herself. <laughs> and uh, I, she walked by me and didn't say anything, and I was like, are we having a breakthrough? And then she turned around and was like, whatever, called me her favorite word, and um, it just popped out of my, it just came out real quick, and I was just like, come tell me my face next time, I was so mad, I was like, what, she walks all the way past me, okay, and I was like, Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lord, I do love her, but what in the world, and she's like, oh, I will, I will, you know, I'm like, whatever, I go into typing class, homegirl comes back with 12 girls, right, and I'm like, cool, cool, at this point, I, first of all, where's my typing teacher, like, I don't even know, taking a smoke somewhere, I don't know, <sighs> I don't have friends in this class. I'm like, cool. So, and it's like the quad, you know, it is a mess. And everybody knows Veto hates Jennifer. So now at this point, you know, she's come back with her 12 friends ready to tell me to my face. You know, I'm like, at this point, I'm like, we just need to get this over because I, I I'm done, right? So, I, but I do, I genuinely had a heart change towards her. And so I walk out. And now it's like my school's so ridiculous. I was like, fight, fight. You know, there's hundreds of kids have rushed out into the quad. I'm like, well, here goes my testimony. Okay, because I'm trying to lead these people to Jesus, and I, we're about to go right here. Like, what is happening? All these people, she's got all her friends around her. And um, in that moment, I'm like, it was like that place, I don't know. I, I wouldn't normally have ever said this, but something because my heart had shifted towards her. And in that moment, I stood there, and I said, you know what, Veto? I'm going to, everybody's there, right? I'm going to stand here. Listen, this took a lot of Jesus to say this. I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to let you hit me. If you can give me one reason why you hate me. And it wasn't coming from being sassy. It was genuinely coming from a place of loving her. And she stood there, and she was like, uh, 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 you know, just looked really stupid. And finally, you know, people are looking at her, and she's like, I I don't need a reason to hate you. And everybody starts laughing. 
And now she's getting really insecure because everybody's laughing at her. And I stood there, and I go, you do re- realize how ridiculous you sound, right? And she, and it's kind of this moment's escalating, and she's getting so frustrated, she ends up taking off. <laughs> and I was like, what? Well, it just happened to be a Friday night. And uh, Nate Bennett knows what happens on Friday nights. It was a football game. You guys, star quarterback over here, everybody. Star quarterback right there. All right, he knows. Just slayed it Friday night. Come on. Sure did. And uh, it's a football game. And I'm thinking, I should not go because there will be a fight (laughs) with me in it. And uh, I thought, I'm going to sneak in. I'm going to sit in the bleachers. I'm going to hide. I want to go to the game. I do, and I see Veronica, and she walks in. I'm like, crap. And she sees me up in the bleachers, and she starts beelining for me. And I'm like, we're going to fight in the bleachers? Awesome. Great. I'm at the very top of the bleachers. (laughs) Like, now somebody's going to die. You know, like, what is happening? And she comes all the way up, and all my friends are like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And she comes, and she sits next to me, and she looks at me, and she's like, you made me look like a complete idiot today. And I was like, no, I didn't. You made yourself look like an idiot. That's what I told her. And I said, <laughs> I said, um, I don't know why we keep doing this. Like, how, you know, and I just began to just try to be kind and encourage her. And she got up and walked away. The very next day, she showed up on my doorstep at home, weeping. Her, boy, her boyfriend lived a block away. He had just beat her. She showed up. She's like, I don't know where to go. I, I need help, you know. Can you give me a ride? Can you help me? I end up leading her to Jesus. Come on. Yeah, I did. I led her to Jesus. We became friends. I was in her wedding. Listen, I'm not even kidding, y'all. I tell you this story, though. I tell you this story. Because I think sometimes we're waiting God to, like, smite evil people. Or we're waiting God to, for God to, like, do these crazy things, and he's like, I'm waiting to change your heart. Because if I can get love inside of you, all of a sudden anything's possible. Right? All of a sudden the game has changed if love can get welled up inside of you because that is the power source for your life. That is what's going to make you different. That's what's going to set you apart. Listen, go love the vetoes of the world, all right? Um. I need to stop telling you guys these stories. <laughs> You're all going to be like, my pastor has got problems. Um, <laughs> the word empowered means given the authority and power to do something, having the knowledge, confidence, resources, and ability to do it. God-given power and strength. Are we hustling and trying to do things in our own strength? Or are we leaning into the fact that we are empowered through the Holy Spirit to do great things? It's a very different way to live, right? We know in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We receive power when the Holy Spirit gets up in the mix of your life. That's where the power comes from. Right before Jesus ascended to heaven, he promised his followers that he would send us a helper who would be with us. And I love that it says, when, you know, when you receive pa- you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses. So the Holy Spirit's activity in our life produces something. We start doing things different. We start getting active in our, in our faith, Right? The Holy Spirit's job is to empower us to progress in our spiritual lives. Um, I think it was Dan or Cody. One of you this morning was talking about being on a spiritual treadmill. Is that you? Yeah. It's like many times in life, right, we kind of, we're coasting on this just spiritual treadmill. And the reality is the Holy Spirit is trying to activate us and empower us to actually begin to move, to not just coast, but begin to move. To begin to, to be new, to begin to, to have breakthrough. The Holy Spirit wants to give you strategy for your situation right now. Why would we ever, why would we ever go through life and not embrace or utilize our power source? Listen, if you've got some funky kind of feelings toward the Holy Spirit, 
my prayer is that you would lean in and get some healing and get a right perspective. Don't let people ruin the Holy Spirit for you. You need the Holy Spirit in your life. You need your power source, right? You, you, need, you need the ability to do things that we can't do in our own strength. So I want to just briefly talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of things. I'm only going to focus on two this morning. Um, two things. Um, because the Holy Spirit's our, our comforter and our counselor and our coach and all kinds of things. But I want to talk about the two, two areas um, that are key in walking empowered. Number one is the Holy Spirit is trying to make you holy. Trying to make you holy, right? Notice it's not called the weird spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit has no interest to in just try to make you weird and flaky and we got enough of that. It's not called the dominating spirit. Let me push you down and tell you what's up. No, no. It's not called the dominating spirit. It's not called the judgmental spirit. Well, I got the Holy Spirit. I'm right and you're wrong. I'm more anointed. No, nope, not called that. It's called the Holy Spirit. Do you ever pray for God? Not to God, for God? I do. I pray for the Holy Spirit. Y'all, I can't imagine how hard of a job this would be to out here trying to make us holy. I mean, can you imagine? That's your job? You're looking at just the last couple years, looking at American Christians and being like, for real? This is my job? I got to make them holy? I got to work this out in them, right? Sometimes I feel like the Holy Spirit looks at us like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that. Just drink it in. All of our pride, our selfishness, our lack of love, our self-righteousness, our lack of self-control, our judgment, our overly, you know, confidence, you know, being obsessed with our own opinion, our lack of humility, our laziness, our worldliness. I think sometimes he looks at us like that and is like, dude, I don't get paid enough. So I pray for the Holy Spirit. John 16, 7 through 15 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because I don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and what he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. I love this. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us of sin and wrong thinking. This is part of... The secret sauce of how you get empowered in your life. So that's why we're talking about this, right? The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. When was the last time you were convicted? I mean, if it's been a minute, you might want to lean in a little more. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and leads us towards Jesus, right? He's trying to pull us, he, she, you know. Don't mind my pronouns here. It's, he's neither male nor female, right? God is all. So God is trying to pull us towards, the Holy Spirit is trying to pull us towards Jesus and to take our place and our authority and our identity. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth or are we looking to, to Facebook and Twitter to lead us into truth? Are we looking to Fox News and CNN to lead us into truth? Are we looking to what everybody else is saying and, you know, to lead us into truth? Or are you truly allowing the spirit of truth to lead you into truth? Because it is his job to lead us into truth and to convict us of sin. Hear me. It is not the Holy Spirit's job to convict you of other people's sin. We seem to be professional at knowing and being convicted of other people's sin. Trust me, friends, he has got plenty to do with you, okay? 
He's got plenty of work to do in your own life. You don't need to be worried about anybody else's sin. Okay, the Holy Spirit's trying to work on us. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth, but once again, truth cannot be separated from love. And truth and love produce real fruit in our lives. So instead of pulling the God card in your life, right, like the, well, God told me. Well, God told me. We, we like to use that card a lot. Or I just feel, we can, you know, I just feel in my spirit. Listen, and let's be honest, because many times that's not God at all. That's just what you want. That's just what you want to believe about those people. It's just what you want to believe about fill in the blank. Afghanistan, the vaccine, Republicans, Democrats, your neighbor, black people, white people, Asians. That's just what you want to feel about them. Too honest? We use the God card, and here all along, all along we thought taking God's name was, we weren't allowed to say, oh, my God taking God's name in vain. This is taking God's name in vain. That's how you take God's name in vain, right? And that's dangerous ground. And so when you think about that, right, you you cannot separate the spirit of truth from love and real fruit in our lives. So instead of just using the God card, when, when people disagree with you, just let your fruit speak for itself. Because if it's God, there will be fruit, Right? Because when the Holy Spirit is actively working in your life, you are empowered to do what others cannot do. Let the Holy Spirit speak for itself. The Holy Spirit's like that check engine light in your car, right? Convicting us of sin. Um, Romans 5 says, but that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence knowing that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance. And patient endurance... Uh, will refine our character. And proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Notice this. There's two paths here. The first path, suffering, right? It's, they both start with suffering. But the first path, suffering, pain, problems, challenges, trials. Anybody have some of these before? Okay. This week alone, right? We understand this. So this starts with suffering, with hard things. It can produce in you, the first path, patient endurance. That means you don't give up when it's hard. You don't walk away from God. You don't lay down your morals. You don't quit the job or quit the marriage or quit the whatever because it got hard. Patient endurance. And when we step into patient endurance, which only can come through the Holy Spirit, then it produces proven character in us. Character. I don't know where we ever thought that we could be powerful ministers of God, powerful Christians without having character. It produces proven character. And then when you have proven character, it produces hope. And when there's hope in you, all of a sudden you're experiencing the endless love of God and it's dripping out of your life. But the other path is when suffering comes, when hard times come, We get impatient and we quit. We give up. We get frustrated. We walk away. Because it's, you know, a lot of times it's easier just to change your job than change your, you know, have the hard conversation that needs to be had. Or change your circumstances rather than, than changing your character of what's getting so irritated in me by these circumstances. Right? So suffering can then produce impatience and quitting, and that produces a lack of character, and a lack of character produces hopelessness and disappointment in us, which then produces missing out on experiencing the transformative love of God in our lives and for others to experience it. If we're going to really see the world around us experience the transformative love of God, we have to pick the right path. Our submitting to the Holy Spirit opens us up to powerful fruit in our lives. A holy life looks like a life of love. A holy life looks like a life that's embracing the hard, growing in character, and being so full of hope and love that it spills out. Holy Spirit makes us holy. Second thing about the Holy Spirit I want to talk about is that the Holy Spirit gets you active. The Holy Spirit is trying to get you active. Okay? 
as we become more holy and more like Jesus, we get awakened and impassioned to do the Father's will. As you spend time in the weeping room, you, your heart gets wrecked for what breaks God's heart, and you no longer can just sit around. Apathy is no longer an option. For God so loved the world that he gave, right? When love truly begins to transform you through the Holy Spirit, you can't help but show up, but give, but, but step in, but do something. Christianity has always meant to be active. We're active, right? This is what the Holy Spirit's trying to get us active. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to go and to do, and it's to lay our lives down for others. See, it's not just about power. It's about people. It's not just about miracles. It's about sacrificial love. Miracles will flow, trust me. But they flow from having your heart be so gripped for humanity. When people, when we really, you know, let love and people be the driving force in our life, all of a sudden, everything becomes possible. The Holy Spirit's the great activator in our lives. Acts 2 says this, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were sitting in. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in new tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to one another who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Look at the fruit of what came of the Holy Spirit coming in their lives. All of a sudden, there's all this momentum. All of a sudden, they're praying together, they're selling things, they're getting activated, they're, they're on mission together, right? They're loving their neighbors because people are coming into faith. They're eating together, they're gathering, they're having community. It wasn't like the Holy Spirit came on them and they went in their prayer closet alone for the next 20 years. No. They got active. They were empowered and active to, to pull heaven to earth. The Holy Spirit is trying to get us active. You know, we, we hear in, in 1 Corinthians 4, um, you can read that at home, but that, is, that God has given each one of us spiritual gifts, right? We all have different spiritual gifts, different things God has given us. And it says that we have these gifts, the Holy Spirit gives us these gifts so that we can help each other. You see, the gifts God has given you, the talents he's given you, aren't just to, you know, make you rich. They're not just to give you a comfortable life. They're not just to give you street cred. The gifts the Holy Spirit gives us are to serve, to help others, to build, right? It's all about, once again, it all comes back to love. We are empowered in love and through love to love. And when we're being transformed by that love and, and wildly loving others, all of a sudden, there's great authority. All of a sudden, the Veronicas are knocking on your door, right? Like, all of a sudden, things begin to, to happen that weren't happening two months ago. See, love is the lifeline. Through the Holy Spirit, love is what truly empowers us. Why is the Holy Spirit trying to activate us? Because we're empowered by God. Remember, we're chosen. We are heirs of the kingdom. We lack nothing. We hold the keys of the kingdom. We're powerful citizens. We have the ability to shift eternities. We have the ability to impact lives. We have the ability to speak over diagnoses and see them shift. We have the ability to see supernatural provision come, right? Guys, I don't know about you. We did not sign up for some powerless, you know, just religious Christianity. The kingdom of God is real. The power of God is real. 
Lives are transformed. Impossible things happen. Miracles are, are, are literally our inheritance. And the world is desperate to see a powerful church. They've just, I think, lately been seeing a, a grumpy, arrogant church in a lot of ways. And the world is hungry to see a powerful church who calls on heaven and things shift. Who demons cower when you walk in the room. The world is longing to see a church that has spent time in the intimacy chamber, that has spent time in the weeping room, that cares about what God cares about more than their own politics, more than their own comfort, more than their own opinion. The world is longing to see heaven's strategy. Let me tell you, the best of the best, as we're watching play out all over the world, the best of the best cannot figure out what to do. About wars, about nations, about diseases, the best of the best are struggling. Remember John 14, 12. Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. This is the invitation. We've heard it. Could it be true? Could it be real? We're actually invited to do even greater things than Jesus did through the Holy Spirit? I've said this so many times, but it's like, what could be greater, right? Right? What could be greater? I don't know. I wrestle that out, but sometimes I wonder. It's like Jesus fed the 5,000. What if we could get in the strategy room and get strategy to end global hunger? Jesus healed the sick. What if we could get in the strategy room and get the strategy to actually eradicate diseases? But We have to actually stop hating science to do that, right, in the name of Jesus, okay? Okay. a little one just a little one (laughs) but it's true right we what is the greater things we're being invited into church may we not forget who we are and the kingdom that we belong to and the power that we have been given through the holy spirit we need all of us to take our kingdom position we need you to to walk in the fullness of the empowerment that god has given you but let me tell you what you cannot take the gifts and leave the fruit My God, we cannot do that. You can't want the gifts and and not want the fruit, right? It's actually through being unified with him, through that place of love, as he's working out more patience and peace and kindness and gentleness in you, that the power can really flow. That's what God's doing. He's trying to get us active. Right? The Holy Spirit's job isn't just to to do crazy miracles and and give us goosebumps, right? It's the Holy Spirit's job is to to convict us of sin, to to help us to become like Christ so that we can move in great power and great authority. It's to help connect you more and more to Jesus so that you can become like him. Love and power fuse together in our lives. You know, we want the baptism of fire, but the fire first comes to burn up our flesh and our pride, and our selfishness. And that fire sets us ablaze for the world around us. You know, as we wrap up, the, I, I want us to think about this. The Holy Spirit is the change agent. And we are empowered. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We are empowered to be different than those around us. We don't have to be afraid of what people are afraid of. We don't have to jump on a bandwagon going left or right or who knows where. Like you can just, you can just walk in the fullness of God. We are empowered to do everything God has called us to do. But I want to encourage you. You can come up, Rico. Thank you. I want to encourage you that just like that vision, I, I, want to, I wanted to give you a picture of it starts with intimacy. It starts with real connection with him. Right? You can't be an outsider kind of just watching everybody else in the house. Like he's inviting you in to commune with him. 
just as you are. You don't have to have it all together. Just begin to commune with him. And from that place, he takes us to a more mature love where our hearts begin to to break for what breaks his heart. I mean, have you asked him lately what he thinks about your classmates? When you're sitting there bored in class, look around and be like, what do you think about that person? (laughs) When you're bored at work, what do you think about that person? You see, when we begin to sit with him and see what he sees and feel what he feels and weep with what makes his heart break, all of a sudden we begin to be changed. We're the ones who change. So many of us, it's like we want, the, we're so desperate to see the world around us change, and that's good, but you know what? It's not going to change until we change, right? Until we get stand empowered. And as we let God, as we spend time in that weeping room and let God transform us, grip our heart with compassion, to literally compassion just becomes branded on you, embedded in you. And then there's this incredible invitation to come into the strategy room. Listen, we need you in the strategy room. I, I believe right now in heaven there's, there's just specific strategy that's literally got your name on it. There is strategy that you're supposed to come and access. There is strategy for your family, for your community, for that group of people you've been passionately trying to, to love on. There is strategy for businesses that are to be started, for, for things that are, you know, solutions to, to, you know, issues on your school board. There is strategy right now with your name on it. But if we just bypassed intimacy, if we just bypassed compassion and just went and grabbed strategy, we would just build our own thing. And there's plenty of that happening and plenty of, of people being hurt by it. But here's what we are empowered to do. We're empowered to be encounter love, be transformed by love, and then step powerfully into the world around us. Because love becomes the driving force. Because it's all about people and it's all about God's heart for them. I want to encourage us, church. Listen, maybe you're visiting here. This is a community of people that believes God can do anything. And I'm not talking just in theory, just on our statement of faith. I'm talking in our lives. This is a community of people that goes after the impossible. In every area, whether it's Somebody needs a physical miracle in their body. Somebody needs a a miracle in their marriage. We want to see transformation in our criminal justice system, our foster care system. This is a community of God that believes that, that God can do anything. But listen, we have to marry that belief with some fruit. We've got to marry that belief with the power to really step in. And that understanding, church, that we are empowered, that he has chosen us, that we are heirs, that we are citizens, and we are empowered. I was telling a friend recently, I felt like the last like year, I kept looking around at the church, not this church, just the Big C Church, and kind of looking around and saying, when are the adults in the room going to stand up? When are the adults going to stand up? And they never did. It felt like it. There was plenty of people that did. But it felt like, where's the adults in the room? And I felt like the Lord say, Quit waiting for an adult to stand up. You be the adult. You stand up in the room. You release peace. You release balanced perspective. You release hope. You, like, we can't be looking to other people to fix what's wrong in the world when it's Christ in us, friend. It's Christ in us. It's the Holy Spirit in you. You are empowered to preach good news. You are empowered to shift realities. You are empowered to do what people say can't be done. It's not by your list of qualifications. It's by his list. It's good news. We're empowered. So may we truly, truly link ourselves to love so that we can step in fully and have authority. Amen? All right. I am chosen. I am a citizen. I am empowered. Will you stand as we close? 
Father, I thank you for every person in this room. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the invitation of where you're leading us through Ephesians, God. God, I, I don't want to just have some love. God, I want to be consumed by love. God, I don't want to just have some of the Holy Spirit. I want to be consumed by the Holy Spirit in my life. I recognize, Holy Spirit, that you are trying to make me holy and you're trying to, to get me active. And Father, we submit and we surrender to your work in our lives. I thank you for this incredible community of people. And Lord, for anybody that's just felt a little beat down in this season or disempowered, I pray right now that you would just set it right. I pray that they would remember how powerful they are in you. That they would remember that, that royal blood flows through their veins. That they would remember that mountains bow at our God who lives in us. God, I pray that we would never dumb you down because of our experiences. But that we would put a demand on our experiences to rise up to who the word of God says you are. And Father, I pray for all of us, wherever we are in our journey. For those who've never really been in the intimacy chamber, Lord, I pray that this would be a season that they become so deeply connected to you, God. Deep communion, deep intimacy in relationship with you. And Father, for those who are ready to step into mature love, I pray, God, that you would break our heart for what breaks yours. We know, God, that it's going to cost us our own agenda, our finances, our comfort, our time, our own will, our pride, we lay it down, Jesus. We say, God, we want to be consumed with what breaks your heart. God, we want to fit through the door of the strategy room, Lord. We're tired of being too fat, Lord. We want to fit through the door. So, God, I pray that you would grip us with what breaks your heart. God, I pray that you would help us to fall in love with people the way you love them. And, God, I thank you for those in this room that you are beckoning and calling into the strategy room. I pray even now, I pray this week, Lord, even just for a, a release of divine strategy. Just ideas that would pop in their head, just an understanding they didn't have before, Lord. Clarity. God, I pray that you would release that strategy over every one of us. whether it's strategy for parenting, strategy for sports, strategy for how to eat healthy. I mean, it's, it's, you've got strategy for everything. And so, Lord, I pray that you would release that in every area of our life. We thank you, Father, that you have not left us alone. We have the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us and to coach us, and there is nobody better. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome your work in our life. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.